the Hôtel Dieu, or God's Hostel, a hospital for the poor, was founded by Chancellor Rollin in Beaune, close to the Duke's capital at Dijon. The initials of Nicolas Rollin and of his wife, Guigon de Salin, and their coats of arms appear in the stained glass and the floor tiles of the buildings, making it clear that the hospital was a gigantic memorial to the donors. On this Sunday, the 4th of August, 1443, neglecting all human cares and in the interests of my salvation, in recognition of the goodness of our Saviour, from whom all benefits proceed, I found and donate irrevocably in the town of Bone, a hospital for the poor and the sick. Such acts of piety were often performed by the rich in the Middle Ages for the good of their souls, but seldom on this massive scale. In this case, contemporaries viewed Roland's wealth with hatred and his professions of charity and spirituality with cynicism. And it's one of the mysteries of the time that such men seem to combine an austere, rigid piety with excesses of cruelty, of calculating greed, and of, to us, sickening ostentation. King Louis XI himself said of Roland, he made enough people poor to make a pauper's hospital necessary. And the hospital was where the poor came to die. Here in the Middle Ages were two rows of 31 beds where the poor lay two or three to a bed. The 15th century was a time of terrible famine, war, and plague. And in a bad year, thousands of people could die in a place like this. And so, thoughtfully, the Chancellor had provided that each of his patients could look from his or her bed to the wall above the high altar where there hung a tremendous vision of the end the last judgment of Roger van der Weyden. On the day of judgment, the dead rise from the earth to be judged by their savior. Christ sits enthroned in glory above the archangel Michael, who holds the scales which will weigh the vices and virtues of all who are to be judged on the day of reckoning. St. John the Baptist, Mary, the Twelve Apostles, and other holy figures intercede on behalf of the sinners, and the lucky few are ushered through a bland Gothic gateway into the kingdom of heaven. This painting was done with bright colors, so it could be seen by the sick even from their deathbeds. Van der Weyden excelled at depicting the inner emotions of his characters. And on Christ's left, we see the damned in a state of frenzy, drawn inexorably towards the flames of hell. There are no demons to drag them down. In the words of a local theologian, the weight of sin upon the conscience is sufficient to make the damned fall into hell as heavy as lead. As the year 1500 approached, many were convinced they were living through the last days of mankind. While the Turks threatened Christendom from the outside, Europe was tormented by political and religious tensions. In the Netherlands, Hieronymus Bosch painted this strange vision of hell, composed of images suggesting the psychological disintegration of the late medieval world and the tensions of his time. Industrial furnaces, armies on the march, artillery bombardments at night. The German printmaker who took the apocalypse, as described in the Revelation of St. John the Divine, 
and transformed it into his own pictorial territory was Albrecht Dürer, the first major artist to publish his work in the form of a book. Dürer exploited contemporary interest in the revelations of St. John by designing and carving 15 woodcut block prints which reduced the 22 chapters of St. John's text into an extraordinarily action-packed visual adventure which swept Western Europe. It made him the most famous graphic artist of his day, and the series itself was of enduring fame used by artists, sculptors, painters, graphic designers for the next 500 years. Albrecht Dürer was clearly a precocious artist. He was the son of a Nuremberg goldsmith and drew this portrait of himself at the age of 13. He became the first artist in Western art to make a detailed series of self-portraits throughout his life, analyzing his changes of mood and image. Dürer studied nature with the same incisive vision with which he analyzed himself. He was one of the first artists to go into the open to paint watercolors from direct observation. He wrote, we German artists have grown up like wild trees in the forest, knowing nothing of the rules of proportion and perspective. These watercolors were painted while Dürer was traveling from Nuremberg to Venice. He wished to learn from Italian art and to have his own status as an artist acknowledged in the land of the Renaissance. 